Hey, good morning, Stevens Creek. Welcome, Grovetown Campus, South Campus. Welcome to you folks just traveling wherever you are, watching online, and to those uh, here in the room at the Augusta Campus. Man, we are so glad to see you. Real quick, before we jump into the sermon, uh, let me camp out for just a minute on one of the announcements you heard, and it's about the giving tree. So one of the best Christmas traditions that we do here at the Creek every year is is help kids right here in our community in in under-resourced situations that might not otherwise get any Christmas at all, and and to come alongside those families and to sort of adopt those kids by getting their Christmas and letting them see the love of Jesus in a really tangible way. And every single year, you guys blow me away with your generosity. I love being part of such a generous church, especially when kids are involved. You guys just, just step up. And this year, we've got more than ever. There are 1,200 kids in our community that, uh, that are looking to us, to Stevens Creek, to, to meet that need. And I think over 800 of those 1,200 have already been sponsored, just showing how amazingly generous you guys are. But today is the last day that, that it's going to be out there, just with the timeline we have. So if your family could, could take one, or you as an individual could take one, or more than one, we would love to see every single one of those kids uh, taken care of. So just want to give a quick plug for that, and thank you guys in advance for all you're doing there. So we are back for week two of the Armor of God series. And if you missed last week, we're in Ephesians chapter six, where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. So the book of Ephesians is called that just because that was the original audience of this letter. He wrote to his friends who lived in Ephesus, the Ephesians. They were a church that Paul had started. So Paul had traveled there early in his missionary journeys, and he had led them to Christ and established a church there. That church had grown Ephesus was a big city in the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, It was a modern city. It was a city that that was thriving, but it also had a lot of sin, a lot of sexual brokenness, a lot of idolatry, and and frankly, a lot of the the same things that we see 2,000 years later in 21st century America. But once those early Christians really got established and, and started following Jesus and living by the word, it changed their lives, and it started changing their community around them. And so this was sort of Paul's home church. He had spent years with these folks. But now, toward the end of Paul's life, he's under house arrest in Rome, where eventually he's going to be executed because of his faith, which he's not worried about at all because he knows he's going to be with Jesus, but he's wanting to make sure that the time he has left on earth is really meaningful. And so he's writing letters to to these people that he's loved along the way to kind of give them some instructions for life. And as he's writing the letter to the Ephesians, he ends it by saying, listen, I want you guys to be ready for for all life's battles, and I, I want you to put on the armor of God. And last week, we talked about what that looks like. I had a football player or a mannequin that was dressed like a football player on stage, and we went through the armor, the helmets like this, the shoulder pads, and the the shoes, what it all represents. Now, the armor of God is is invisible, but it protects us from very, very real battles. And one of the unspoken benefits of the armor of God, this isn't in the Bible, but I think you can do this. Next time you go to the doctor, and they have you stand on that scale, and the doctor says, you're overweight, say, I'm not. I'm wearing the armor of God. You just can't see it. It's heavy. I'm in my ideal weight, and I'm not taking this off. So you just you tell that doctor that you're just be you're spiritual. That's why that number is so high. Is that you're just spiritual. So God wants us to wear this armor to be ready for life's battles because He wants us. He wants us to thrive in life. God has a plan for your life. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to do all that He has a comp- He has for you to do. Because life on earth is short. And the Bible wants us to remember how short life is, not in a morbid way, but in a realistic way. The Bible says, Lord, teach me to number my days so that I can gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, Lord, remind me that I'm gonna die fairly soon. But what I'm doing in this life, God, whether I've got five weeks left or 50 years left, let it make an eternal impact for you because everything we do in this life impacts eternity. And God wants us to do all that we can in life. There's going to be an obituary written about all of us someday. And what do you want yours to say? And that's, again, that's not a morbid thought. I think that that's an intentional thought. What are we working towards? What's the life we're trying to live? You know, usually when we're reading an obituary, it's kind of sad because it means somebody's life has ended. But every now and then, an obituary can make you laugh. And that happened a few months ago in my home state of Kentucky a man named James Loveless passed away, and his two sons, who had never apparently written or read an obituary, decided to write their fathers. 
And they submitted it, and the Pulaski Funeral Home in Pulaski County, Kentucky, put it on their website, and it went viral. And millions of people have now read the obituary for James Loveless. And in honor of my home state and all the rednecks who live there, I want to read you just a portion as we remember James Loveless today. You can find this whole obituary online, and it is worth your time. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of it. This is just the last couple paragraphs, and I'm going to do it in my Kentucky accent to give it, to just give it what it deserves, okay? We don't know if he was married, but he definitely was a ladies' man. There was Kathy, Mary Lou, Tammy, Deborah, Carrie, Tina, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's the bones, he told us, as he proudly pointed to his skinny, pasty white legs. Women love a good shin. We think he might even have some females waiting for him on the other side. Jamie loved his family more than anything else in the world, except for ice-cold bush beer, (laughs) room temperature bush beer, team bones, New York strip, prime ribs, shrimp, swimming, poker, hatchback, Mustang GTs, tank tops, Kentucky men's basketball, and his personal copy of Eddie Murphy's Raw. (laughs) He leaves behind his second favorite son, Rocky Loveless, and his favorite son, Rodney Loveless of Science Hill, Kentucky, plus a younger brother, Joey, and an unofficial daughter, Melissa Vance, of the trailer park, (laughs) as well as his favorite pair of old boxer shorts, which have Buttweiser, King of Rears, printed on the back. (laughs) He will be moderately missed. Pulaski Funeral Home is honored to assist the family with arrangements. So that's just a little bit about James Loveless, who I never met in person. Sounds like quite a character. James probably, it sounds like he had some good times, but I can, I can bet that, that James probably didn't live up to his full God-given potential of what God wanted to do through his life. And there's going to come a time when your kids or somebody's writing an obituary about you and about me, and, and what do we want that to be? Because God has a plan for what success should look like with our lives. It's that, it's that we, we fought those spiritual battles with integrity and with faith, that we trusted God's word, that we followed him even on the days when we didn't understand what he was doing, and that ultimately through that, God was molding our hearts to be more like his son's heart, Jesus, and that, that by following him and being part of his family and bringing as many with us as we could on the journey, that our lives would count for eternity. That's what God has in store For you, that's what he wants for you. And as Paul is writing his friends in Ephesus, these are people he loved, people that he had done life with. And he's telling them, I don't want you to settle for anything less than God's best for your life. Don't fall back into your old way of doing things. Don't get caught up in just what the culture says is okay to do because the culture is broken. But instead, continue to love people. Continue to to show that radical love and grace that Jesus has shown you. But also know know that there are going to be battles. There are going to be battles that you're going to fight every single day, and it's the same for us. The spiritual reality has not changed in 2,000 years. It's the same for us. And so these words are true for us as well. So if you're following along in the notes, really the whole overarching point of this whole series is this one. It's that God has given us everything we need to win life's spiritual battles. You already have it in Christ. You have it. From the moment you come to faith in Jesus, you're adopted into God's family. You're enlisted into God's army, and he gives you this, this armor that, that, we, that we're supposed to put on every day, and we have to do the intentional work of, of putting it on. Paul writes this section at the last part of his letter this way, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. So last week, we looked at the armor One piece at a time, what does it mean? What does it represent? How do we put it on? This week, we're gonna continue on that conversation, but we're gonna look at the strategies the enemy is using against us in this battle. Because of this point, the next one, winning spiritual battles starts with identifying the enemy. If you're going to a war, you gotta know what army you're fighting against. If you're you're in a basketball or football game, you have to know what team you're playing against. And then Take it a step farther, you need to know what their strategies are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what they're going to try to do, what's their game plan to get you tripped up. The more you know about them, the more you can properly prepare. So in the very next verse, Paul tells us who our enemy is. He doesn't just say, get ready for spiritual battles, but he says, here's who you're actually fighting. He says, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, 
but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So Paul is talking about a spiritual reality here. Not, not to, to do away with the physical reality and the physical struggles they're facing, because these people understood physical struggles. I mean, Paul was being guarded by actual Roman soldiers with actual spears and actual swords. They understood physical struggles, but Paul's saying, these guys aren't our enemy. This, that's not who our enemy is. They're being manipulated. They're being used, perhaps, by our actual enemy, which is a, a spiritual enemy, because the world thinks all there is is what we can see with our eyes. But Paul, having encountered Jesus and having his eyes open to what's really going on, says, but there's a whole other world, a spiritual world, one that we will see clearly one day, but in the meantime, for us right now in this world, it's still invisible. And that's, that's where the real battle is happening. It's on a spiritual plane, and we have a spiritual enemy who is waging that war, a spiritual enemy that the Bible calls Satan. Now, when you hear Christians talk about Satan, usually one of a few things happens. It, it, people buy into a few myths about the devil. Number one is that he's not real. It's, it's just kind of, he's a fabrication. That's a myth. Number two is that he's just sort of this cartoonish character, right? He, he wears red tights and he has horns and a pitchfork. And that's not true either. The truth about the devil is that he's way smarter than you and me. He's way more powerful than you and me, but... He's no match for Jesus, and because of Jesus, he has no real power over us. However, he'll still do, the devil will still do everything he can to try to discourage, distract, and deceive everyone that he can, and we need to be aware of his game plans. Paul's saying, you got to be aware of his game plans. Some people get like, so like kind of spooky with devil stuff that everything becomes like a a spiritual attack, like there's there's a demon hiding in every bush. Everything that goes wrong in their life, they blame on the devil, you know, it's like, well, you know, I bought a lottery ticket, it didn't win. The devil gave me a dud. It's like, no, you, no, that's not how that works. Or I ran out of gas. The devil, he, he just, he drained my gas tank. It's like, no, you, you just didn't pull over when the light came on. Like, that's not a spiritual attack. You know, or, you know, like the, the devil is, I, you know, I, I, I felt like I should order this thing on the menu and I ordered it and it was really bad. And I just feel like Satan deceived me. It's like, no, he didn't. He doesn't care what you're eating. Like, that's not how spiritual attack works. But there is real spiritual attack that we need to be aware of because Satan is a deceiver. So here's a brief history of our enemy. He was created as an angel, a beautiful, powerful angel named Lucifer. And Lucifer was actually, even though now it has a negative connotation, was a beautiful name. It means son of the morning star. He was powerful and bright and vibrant and cocky, right? Pride, pride is not only like the foundation of what made Satan, Satan, but it's this sin that even now will get us off track for God's plan for our lives faster than anything else, in part because we don't look at it as a serious sin. But the devil, Lucifer, he had pride, and he established the very first civil war in the history of the universe, and he recruited other angels to essentially try to overthrow heaven so he himself could be in charge. He wanted to be God. But God is undefeatable. And so they lost that civil war, were cast down to earth, where one day Jesus will come once and for all, send them to their their final and eternal punishment. But in the meantime, here, where they still have some influence, you ever heard the expression, misery loves company? Well, they're miserable and they're looking for company. And they are good at recruiting. And they'll recruit through deception, through distraction, through any means that they can. It started at the very beginning when the first human beings were here on earth, Adam and Eve. Satan was present there in that very first scene. And he's whispering there in the Garden of Eden where God had given the first people everything they needed, every opportunity to make the right choice. But to give us, to give us the free will to choose him, he, he gave one choice, just one, one place where they could have rebellion, but he hoped they wouldn't. He said, Here's, you can eat from any of these trees, but this one tree right here, don't eat from that one. That's the only place that's off limits to you. Everything else is for you. And so Satan, of course, gets him to focus on that one tree. He said, did God really say, don't eat from that tree? Did God really say, that's still the way that he whispers today, did God really say, he'll try to get Christians to justify all kinds of stuff that's wrong. Did God really say that, that sex is just for marriage? Because, I mean, nobody really does that, right? I mean, it, if, if he did say that, he's just, he's just holding back on you. He's wanting you to miss out on some fun. Did, did God really say to be 
generous with money, that all, it all belongs to him, and that the first 10% should be a tithe that you bring back to the church, and then you should be generous to others on top of that. Did he really say that? Because you worked for that. That's your money. You, nobody can tell you what to do with that. Did, did God really say to trust his whole word that all of this is true? Because, I mean, surely a lot of this is outdated. I mean, some of it might be good, but, but surely not. Did God really say? And he's still whispering lies like that. He's still doing it, making us trying to think that, that God's holding out on us or that we know better than God for what our lives should look like. And when we step out into rebellion, it, it always hurts us and it always hurts others. But that's, that's the way Satan works. He is, he's a liar. He's a manipulator. He is a tempter. He tempted Jesus himself when Jesus was walking this earth and he was, there was a period of 40 days where Jesus was praying and fasting, preparing for his ministry, and, and Satan appears there. And he's very wily, and he, start, he tries to tempt you where he thinks he's got the most leverage. And with Jesus, he tried to tempt using Scripture. The devil knows the Bible better than you do. And he'll try to twist it, and he'll try to use it. And he'll say, well, hey, Jesus, what about this verse here? Why don't you do this? And, and, and in fact, why don't you just worship me? And, and, this will, and Jesus is like, no, that's not how it works. The Bible says this you have to know the word to be able to use the word as a sword in this battle. We'll get to that the last week of this series, that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. It's our only weapon in this armor. And if we don't know it, if we don't use it properly, then we're going into battle unarmed. Satan tried to, to tempt Jesus. Satan tries to discourage. Satan tries to distract. One name that Jesus uses for Satan is Beelzebub, which means the Lord of the flies. And I love that imagery because as a Christian, Again, the, the devil has no real authority over you or power over you the moment you put your faith in Christ, but man, he can be annoying. And what's more annoying than a fly? Have you ever been in a car with the windows rolled up and a fly starts buzzing around? I have nearly like wrecked on the interstate because there's a stupid fly buzzing around and I just can't get it and I can't think about anything else. I'm obsessed with this fly until it's dead or it's gone or I'm dead. It's like some, one of us is gonna die here, fly. And that's what Satan wants to do. He's, he's got no more power than that fly, but if you give your focus to a fly, it can wreck you. It really can. And so he'll discourage, he'll distract, he'll deceive, he'll distort, and we can't let him. We have to be aware of his tactics not obsessed with his tactics, not obsessed with him. We don't want to give him more stage time than he deserves, but Jesus talked about him quite a bit, so we need to as well because we need to know the kind of attacks that the enemy is going to bring, and here's what he does. The enemy wants to introduce lies and counterfeits to replace God's truth. He's the ultimate counterfeiter. He doesn't want you to settle for real intimacy when he can provide a counterfeit, like pornography, right? I mean, that's one of his most effective counterfeits in the world today. It's like you don't need to actually be in healthy relationship or, or do the work of, of, of abstinence, waiting, waiting for that marriage someday. No, 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 no. You, you can, even if you are married, you just go over here to where it's an instant fix. It's a quick fix. It's, it's a counterfeit. And it's toxic. And, and Ashley, my wife, Ashley and I, we do marriage ministry full time, actually. And so this is one of the things we talk about a lot because... We do a lot of research. We talk to a lot of people. We know even within the church, this is a huge prevalent issue. It's part of my past story as a teenager and young man that I was caught up in this, and I can talk about the wreckage it can bring to your, to your mind and to your relationships. But it is a counterfeit. So many people, so many people are taking the bait of Satan in that issue. And, and I'm saying that today knowing that many here today are caught up in it. And I don't say that to shame you because shame is the devil's game, not God's. Shame is that lying voice that says, you're worthless, you'll all, this is who you are, you'll never be free of this or that. Pride is the other lie, the voice that, that looks at something like porn or any sin and says, well, it's not that big a deal, I can do what I want, it doesn't really affect anybody. Satan will use whichever of those work. If shame works, he'll use shame. If pride works, he'll play to your pride. Jesus does something completely different. He uses what's called conviction. Conviction is like when your conscience feels that sting that says, wait, this isn't good for me, not to punish you, but to get your hand off the hot stove before you burn your hand even more. It says, I've got something better for you. Stop settling for that counterfeit because you're gonna sabotage yourself and the plans that I have for you. Help me, let me help you get free of it. But when we're listening to pride or listening to our own voice, we're gonna think that we're right and that even, even the, the voice of God or even the word of God can't penetrate through our thick skulls 
And we can miss the point. When Jesus was walking the earth, there was a group of religious people called the Pharisees that thought they had it all figured out. And ironically, it was the religious people who thought they had it figured out that were at odds with Jesus the most because Jesus didn't come to make us religious. He came to make us alive. He came to bring us into relationship with God. He came to change the heart. And and religion is just usually man-made rules of, of people telling other people how they're supposed to behave And that's not what Jesus was about. He came to to completely create a new paradigm. So the the Pharisees were looking at God in the flesh, the Savior, the promised Messiah, and they didn't recognize him. They were offended by him. And Jesus calls them out and he says this this to them. They're pretty harsh words. John chapter 8, he says, For you are children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is the embodiment of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Every, when he was asked his mission statement, Pontius Pilate said, what are you about? He said, I came to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So, so Satan is the antithesis of that. He's the opposite. He is the father of lies. He is, he is the deceiver. He'll use maybe a little bit of truth just to make his lies more cunning and more appealing and more palatable, but everything he does is ultimately a lie. And all of us can fall into that. All of us can be deceived. Every single one of us can. Like, do, do this real quick. Everybody's like looking straight ahead with your shoulders where you are. Try to turn your head to the, to the right as far as you can. You might be looking the devil in the back of the head. <laughs> Just kidding, sort of. But, well, this is what I mean by that. So, so the apostle Peter, right? Obviously a Christian, handpicked by Jesus to be a leader. I mean, he's, uh, I mean, we got churches named after him all over the place. He wrote part of the Bible, I mean, a guy that we can just kind of agree, like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he, he's on the right side, the right team. But there's a time in the Gospels where Peter, motivated by pride and by this other agenda, is, is trying to get Jesus to do something different. Like, no, 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 Jesus, you need to do this. You need to do this. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. If Jesus calls you Satan, and you're a disciple, that's a bad day, guys. Because <laughs> Jesus says, listen, you don't have the things in mind. You're not thinking about the things of God. You're thinking about the things of man. You're letting pride motivate. You're being used by Satan in this moment. It doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean any of that. But it means that in this moment, you're listening to the wrong voice. You're being, you are being manipulated by the enemy in this moment. And all of us, all of us have been manipulated at times. If, if Peter could be manipulated, all of us can, and that's why we have to be so on guard. And I think that being aware of that keeps us humble. You know, the Bible tells us Peter was married. So, I mean, I picture in any argument they ever have as husband and wife later in life, when he is like this big spiritual giant, he's like, you know, you need to listen to me. I'm a big deal. I'm the apostle Peter. And she's like, but didn't Jesus call you Satan? I mean, (laughs) never called me Satan. So the Lord keeps us humble. Now, The Lord wants us to be humble, not humiliated, but humble, because humble keeps our hearts dependent on him. And if we don't lean into that that Christ-like humility, then pride or shame, the two other sinful extremes, they're going to get us tripped up into falling into counterfeits. And and this this is one of Satan's biggest tactics, is he will offer you what looks like comfort, what looks like encouragement, but it's really poison. He wants you addicted he wants you dependent on all the wrong kinds of things. And so if, if you're in a place where, you know, you're, you're leaning into some kind of like quick chemical fix to numb the pain instead of doing the work to get healthy and get connected to God, then you're opening the door for the enemy to just have undue influence in your life that will eventually sabotage you mind, body, and soul. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, we kind of had culturally a collective loss Uh, a very beloved actor from the show Friends, uh, Matthew Perry, who had a very public lifelong struggle with addiction. He he tragically died um, way too soon. 
Now, Matthew Perry just a year ago had a best-selling book, a memoir about his own life, where he was very honest about just his, his ongoing struggle to get sober and to get clean. And in light of his death a couple weeks ago, these words, this self-awareness from him, this is, this is a heartbreaking quote. So Matthew Perry said, one of my big problems and the reason I've had trouble getting sober over the years is I never let myself feel uncomfortable long enough to have a spiritual connection. I would always fix things with pills and alcohol before God could jump in and fix me. So here's a guy that that understood that he was taking Satan's bait. Like, this isn't actually helping me. This numbing that I'm doing when I'm, even though the world says, man, you got it all. You're rich, you're famous, people want to be you. And he, in his own words, was miserable. He was lonely, he was broken, he felt worthless. And he said, all I could do to get through that, the moment that discomfort came, I couldn't live with it and I had to numb it. I had to find a pill. I had to get a shot. I had to do something to numb it. But then once I woke up from that numbness, the pain was there and it was bigger than before. So then I had to get more to drink. I had to take more pills. And that is the vicious cycle of addiction. And if you're caught in it, guys, listen, I'm so glad that you're here. This is a safe place for you to recover, for you to get the freedom that you need. You're not meant to do it alone. Satan does his most influential work when he keeps us in isolation. You know, I heard a psychiatrist say, the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is healthy connection. Because every person that's struggling with a chemical addiction, they're almost always doing it separated from healthy connections. Because addiction separates us from the people we love. It it separates us from from that connection and dependence on God. And when we will reestablish those connections the way that God intended, the encouragement and the accountability and the love and the connection that those relationships provide gives us the strength that we need to be on that journey of health and eventually sobriety. But we've got to be willing, Matthew Perry's own words, to be uncomfortable long enough to not have to numb it, but to invite Jesus into that discomfort and to say, Lord, I'm hurting right now. Man, I want to numb this so bad. But I would rather, Lord, stay with you in this moment of discomfort and allow you to carry me through it, knowing that you're going to get me healthy on the other side. And he will. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And if you still got breath in your lungs, God still has a plan for you. Your story doesn't have to end like Matthew's. It's tragic that his story ended that way, but yours does not have to. You don't have to stay on this path. You can get off of it. And we have, we have resources here to help, to help you get off of it. And a lot of people in this church that have testimonies that felt like they were hopeless and felt like they were too far down that road, but now they're clean and now they're helping others to get sober and they would love to talk to you. So just know, know that you're not alone. You don't have to stay alone. But for all of us, whether that's your issue or not, we're all living in a world where we look around and we just see like chaos and we see negative stuff happening all the time and we see the the evidence of the spiritual attack. And in some days it even feels like Satan's winning. But like we talked about last week, the game's already over. Jesus has already won. If you read the end of the book, it's over. It's like we're watching a football game that's already happened that we're watching on DVR. And even when the enemy scores a touchdown, even when the opposition scores a touchdown on a game that's already happened, you can say, but I've seen SportsCenter and my team wins. We're not losing, we're, we win. But it's still in the moment when you see the, the enemy gaining ground, you think, oh my goodness, what's happening? So God told us, when, that's, when that starts to happen, don't get discouraged. This is just a sign that the end is drawing near and that and in some ways be encouraged by it because Jesus is gonna be coming soon. And we talk about end times prophecy. Usually what people are talking about is like wars and things like this, like wars in Israel. And by the way, I do believe the war in Israel is, is part of end times prophecy and signs of, of, of what God has established in scripture. But most of end times prophecy in scripture isn't about war. It's about what's happening in, in people and in cultures and, and how we're responding and how people are embracing sin on an individual level. So this, this is what I mean. I'm gonna read this passage describing the end times. Paul now writing not to the Ephesians, but to his protege, a young pastor named Timothy, saying, Watch out for this is what is going to happen in the last days. And as I read these words, tell me, is this not dead on what you see every time you open social media, every time you turn the news on, every time you, you just walk out your house, you see this stuff. So Paul says this, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there'll be very difficult times. 
For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. This line, man, this, this defines our culture right now. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the very power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. So guys, that's, that's our world, and we shouldn't be surprised when we see it. But, but the Bible's telling us don't get caught up in it. Just because the culture is decaying, we shouldn't decay. The, Jesus says we're salt and light. We should be preserving the culture. We should be standing apart, not in a way that we're looking down on others, but in a way that we're trying to bring them into God's family. Because you remember, people are not ever the enemy. It's not us against them. God wants everybody. He wants us to reach them. It's sin is the enemy. It's the lies they're believing that are the enemy. But what keeps some people stuck and what keeps even sometimes us stuck in unhealthy behaviors and sin and addiction and codependent relationships is whenever you're living in an unhealthy way, somebody is profiting from it and wants you to stay that way. You're addicted, there's somebody that's profiting from that addiction. When you're in a codependent relationship, there's somebody that's benefiting from that. They don't want you to get healthy. In, in, the, in the book of Acts, there's this story of this, this little girl who is, a, you know, she's a servant girl and she is being influenced demonically. But because of this demonic influence, she actually has this supernatural ability to be a fortune teller. So while she's very unhealthy and while she's being gripped by this dark force, her employers are profiting from it because people will come to her and they'll pay them money for her to like, you know, give them their fortunes or read their palms or whatever. They want her to stay unhealthy. So the apostles, the followers of Jesus come along, they see this oppressed little girl and they set her free. They pray for her. Like, no, like Satan, get away from him. This is, this is God's kid. Satan, you get away in Jesus' name. They set her free. She's free. She's healthy. You think everybody would celebrate, but no, the people in her life that were profiting from her brokenness are furious because to, her, to them, she wasn't a child of God. She wasn't a priceless soul. She was a meal ticket. She was a paycheck. When you get healthy, there are gonna be some people in your life that don't like it because you're not partying with them anymore. Or you're not buying from them anymore or you're not, you're not running to them in their drama anymore in this codependent way. And, and those people didn't want what was best for you. And if you're a people pleaser, you know, you might have to do the extra work of saying, listen, I... I I can't live for pats on the back anymore because sometimes those pats were coming from the wrong, for the wrong reasons and I'm gonna have to get healthy. I'm gonna have to create some boundaries because Jesus wants me healthy and I don't wanna settle for anything less. Even if it means some people aren't gonna be part of my life anymore, I'm still gonna love them, I'm still gonna pray for them, but I can't allow their influence here because their influence wasn't doing me any good. All right, we're almost out of time, so let's, let's land the plane. Here, two bits of good news. Number one, the enemy tries to weigh you down with heavy burdens but the armor of God is light. Everything God gives you is light. I know I told you that you could tell the doctor that you're not really fat, it's just the armor of God, but the truth is the armor of God doesn't weigh a thing. Jesus says this, come to me all you are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. You'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear, the burden I give you is light. I mean, doesn't that sound good? Jesus is saying, just come home. Satan wants to weigh you down. The world wants to weigh you down. I come to set you free. Just come home. Last one, we've already talked about this. Because of Jesus, the enemy has no power over you. Never forget that. Never give him more credit than he deserves. He has no power over you. Jesus said this, look, I have given you, that's us, authority over all the power of the enemy. You have more authority than Satan because yours was given by Jesus you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Again, don't let pride puff you up, make you think that, man, I matter because I have this spiritual authority and power. It's like, no, you matter because you're part of God's family. Your, your, your names are registered in heaven. You're part of God's family forever. And don't settle for anything less than that. One quick story and we'll wrap up. I think every single one of us is born 
with a desire for a family that lasts forever. And every desire that you've ever felt in its purest form is something that God intends to fulfill. Now, Satan will offer all kinds of counterfeit for it, but every desire you have in its purest form to, for connection, for purpose, for whatever it is, for love, it's all from God in its purest form. And we're born wanting to be in a forever family. So a few months ago, our youngest son, Chatham, had this friend over for a play date, and they're both eight years old, and this friend was such a sweet kid. But the whole time they were playing, he was carrying around these two stuffed animals. And I'm like, man, that's sweet, but like eight feels maybe a little old to not put down these stuffed animals. And so I, I, I thought there's got to be a story about these stuffed animals. What's the deal? So he, he set him down for a minute, and I, and I took a picture because after the story, that was really meaningful. So here's a picture of the stuffed animals. You know, they're cute and all that. And, and I said, well, tell me about these, buddy. You know, what's this about? And, and this kid comes from a, a, a divorced home. And I about started crying when he, <laughs> when he said this. He said, yeah, he said, I love them. He said, I, I, um, I love having them together because I call this one mama monkey and this one daddy bear. And when I have them together, it reminds me of when my parents were together. And I'm like, I need to go in the other room for a second and uh, just get a hug. Um, I mean, the work Ashley and I do for marriage ministry, I mean, that's, that's, that's why, you know, we want to keep families together. But, but here's the thing, that desire that he has being part of this forever family, it's actually a desire that's, that's much deeper than just a mom and a dad can fulfill, even if his parents never divorce. I mean, it, it's whether you're from a, a single parent home or a blended family or, you know, no one in your family's gotten divorced, ultimately the only family that's gonna last forever is the family that Jesus invites you into. And that desire that all of us have to be loved forever, to be with someone who's never gonna leave us or forsake us, never gonna divorce us, that, that's Jesus, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're young, whether you're old, he's the one that's inviting you into that forever family and saying, yeah, you, you can have healthy relationships and I hope you do and I want you to, but ultimately it, the most important relationship you'll ever have, the one that lasts forever is to come be part of God's family. And that can happen today. If you're here today, you're watching online today, you're in Grovetown today, you're at South Campus today, you've not made that decision to follow Jesus. Today can be your day. And again, it's not inviting you into a religion. It's inviting you into a family where you say, Jesus, rescue me, adopt me, forgive me of the way I live. You paid the price for it on the cross and I received that gift you have for me today. He has got such good things in store for you. So just a moment, I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray for those that wanna make that decision. I also wanna pray for all of us who are gonna walk out these doors into a world of spiritual battles that we're reminded that Jesus is with us in those battles and because of him, We've already won. Let's stand together. At every campus, let's stand together. I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. Father God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for equipping us with everything we need to win life's spiritual battles. Lord, I pray against the influence of the enemy over every person here, every family here. God, we say only Jesus is going to run my life. Only Jesus is going to run my family. And for anyone here that hasn't yet made that decision to follow you, Lord, let today be the day that they stop waiting on the sidelines and they step into the huddle. They step into the team, the family. They say, Jesus, save me today. Forgive me of the way that I've lived. Make me into the person I was meant to be. Adopt me into your family. Lord, I give you my past, my present, my future, and I will follow you all the days of my life and into eternity. And God, we welcome the brothers and sisters who reached out in faith today to join your family that family, the only family that will never end. We celebrate them. But for all of us, God, that are still in this broken world, still have spiritual battles to fight, I pray you'd give us strength, that you'd give us encouragement, that you'd give us peace. You'd help us lock arms with one another and face those battles together, Lord, and stand strong against all the temptations and distractions the enemy wants to bring because we know he has no real power over us and we're so thankful for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you give the Lord a hand today? He is so good to us. Guys, thank you for being here. Don't forget about those kids out there on the giving tree. There are still several hundred kids who are looking looking to us this Christmas. Let's not let them down. God bless. We'll see you next week.